for them the war's not over. Their, uh, uh, you know, their salary can only support their monthly salary only supports them for a week. So uh, it's uh, very difficult for them to survive. And they all would talk to us and say, "Please, we're being strangled. Our leadership." nothing's happening the people at the top in power they are getting all the food they want they have nice cars they're not in any difficulty at all so this business of fighting Saddam Hussein by starving the people of Iraq or putting the squeeze on them uh, over and over again that's what we heard please don't do it and I, I, hmm. I checked this out I'd read about it before I went there and I checked with taxi drivers and I checked with doctors and I, I checked with a lot of people they said yeah we feel that uh, in the West you all know how to use your equipment and you're well trained on it but we don't think the Saudis know how to use it and, uh, they were probably the ones who hit our hospitals and so forth uh, he said I don't I don't know too much about Saddam Hussein but the main thing I have against him is that uh, he was one of our hitmen when I was in the CIA Bill Kelsey lived and worked in the Middle East for many years. He just returned from Iraq and shares his experiences with us right now on Alternative Views. Bill Kelsey is back with us on Alternative Views. He's an expert on the Middle East, having lived there for 14 years, taught English there, and uh, has made two trips to the Middle East. Uh, the, the last time was uh, right, uh, right after the war that he was on our program, and this time he's just come back from a trip to the Middle East, to uh, Jordan, Israel, and to uh, Iraq. We're going to talk about the Iraq situation on this Alternative Views. But before we have our interview, here are some news stories from the Alternative Press. It's kind of curious that Elliot Richardson has taken on the Inslaw case. He represents the software's developer, and he says there's more evidence that President Bush has been involved in this case than there was Richard Nixon's involvement in the early days of, of uh, Watergate. And he's calling for a special prosecutor to investigate the alleged theft of a legal software system. And the theft was by the Justice Department. The Justice Department stole the software and altered it, according to the owners of the Inslaw company. And several witnesses have testified that, in fact, the uh, modified software was sold to governments of 88 countries. And the kicker is, of course, that the U.S. also has the software, and they can use this in order to tap into the information that's being processed by in these countries where the software is being used. Richardson, Elliot Richardson, as I said, is an establishment man. He's now in private practice in Washington, D.C. He's probably best remembered uh, during the so-called, I think it was Friday Night Massacre or Saturday Night or Friday Night, some night massacre, uh, when he resigned as Attorney General in 1973, after refusing Richard Nixon's order to fire the Watergate Special Prosecutor, Archibald Cox. So the boys in the establishment are fighting a little bit. 
During the hearings in which Clarence Thomas was confirmed as Supreme Court Justice, there was a lot of discussion about his love of pornography, the sexual harassment of one of his secretaries, Anita Hill, but they really didn't discuss some of the incredible scandals that Clarence Thomas was involved in. For one thing, when he was the head of the Office of Economic Opportunities, there was another sexual harassment claim that was made in the Baltimore office that Thomas involved himself in a conspiracy to cover over. Although there were very serious claims of sexual harassment by one of the employers there who had harassed many different women, Thomas didn't take the criticism seriously. He didn't press charges. He made a ruling that made it appear that sexual harassment was not an important issue in his office. And for some reason, this simply was not brought up in the hearing. But the biggest scandal that wasn't brought up in the hearing has to do with a ruling that Thomas made as a judge, as a federal judge, after he had been appointed by Ronald Reagan to that office. Clarence Thomas's sponsor was John Danforth, a senator from Missouri, who happens to be the wealthiest senator in the whole Senate. He is a multi-billionaire, and you saw him every day defending his prodigy, Clarence Thomas. For years, Danforth has sponsored Thomas in federal job after federal job, defending him time after time. Well, it appeared that when Clarence Thomas was judge, federal judge, there was a business court case that he had to rule on that involved none other than John Danforth, who is one of the owners of the Ralston Purina Company. This court decision involved millions and millions of dollars, and Thomas did not rule himself out ineligible to rule on this, which he should have, because clearly he had a conflict of interest since he was obviously a personal friend of Senator Danforth. Instead, he ruled on the case, and surprise, surprise, he ruled in Danforth favor. This issue also is not brought up by the mass media in the tremendous amount of discussion and controversy surrounding Clarence Thomas and shows when it comes to the big bucks, that's the limitation of public debate. That simply the ruling class, the wealthiest corporate elite, simply don't get criticized in the mass media on things like conflict of interest. So Senator Danforth remains one of the senators that has the highest reputation in the Senate. He's supposed to be honest, to have integrity. He was speaking very moralistically, attacking these liberal senators who were attacking Clarence Thomas. And yet he allowed this to happen. So much for justice in the United States and so much for our watchdog media that keep their eye on corruption in the government. Let's talk about uh, Lockerbie and Libya. You know, Mark Twain said something. He says um, when uh, a lie decides to... Uh, get out. A lie makes it halfway across the word, world before truth has a chance to get out of bed and pull its pants on. <laughs> and so, I mean, who knows? Maybe we'll find out in another 20, 30 years what really happened with the Lockerbie incident. But I remember that the uh, two years ago there was final, final, final proof that it was in fact Syria and the Syrian intelligence and they named individuals and it was the Syrians who had done this. And, then there was final proof that the Iranians had done it, and then there was final proof that the uh, Ahmed Jibril gang was the uh, Ahmed Jibril being uh, the exactly. Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine General Command. It's a splinter offshoot. It's uh -huh. anti-Arafat, by the way. Um, there was final proof that that group had been responsible. Meanwhile, anything that was said about Libya, I thought the common consensus up until recently was that, aha, Ronald Reagan bombed Libya and it taught Gaddafi a lesson and there's been no terrorism mm -hmm. since then. That's what you hear on uh, radio talk shows and all. See, it did the job because see, we haven't had any trouble the job. with so, uh, the So it's, it's interesting, if in fact Libya did do this, if Libya did do this, it shows that uh, um, that retaliation, uh, killing Gaddafi's daughter, was not uh, the way to go about these things. Of course, whatever the United States retaliated against Libya for, it's not clear what it was that Libya did or if Libya did what is said that Libya did. We don't know that. We don't know that. There are other rumors that it, that was really uh, the, the Ahmed Jibril group or the Iranians or the Syrians. And uh, one thing I find fascinating is that um, during the war, one of the little-known pieces of trivia was that the Ahmed Jibril group uh, 
radical, anti-American, anti-Israeli, anti-Arafat. He thinks Arafat's a, tra a traitor because he's uh, Yasser Arafat's too pro-American and too pro-Israeli. Okay, that fellow sided with the Allies. See, in the Iran-Iraq war. Yeah, I, I yeah. Mean, in the I mean, American-Iraq war. Right. He didn't. He didn't fire any shots. But uh, one would have presumed that in any conflict between America and the Arab world that uh, the Ahmed Jibril group of all people would certainly be setting off bombs and so forth. No, in fact, he, uh, uh, Yasser Arafat allied himself with Saddam Hussein and his enemy uh, Ahmed Jibril allied himself with the Saudis. And I, I think he collected a lot of money for it and presumably one of uh, his mm. rewards yeah. is to not be blamed anymore for, uh, for the Lockerbie incident. There was another story in relationship to the Lockerbie incident. It was uh, big news up in Canada, first reported by the Toronto Star, mm -hmm. where a reporter had come across, no, it was a, he got a hold of a report by the company. Mm -hmm. What was it, Pan Am? Is that the? Pan Am. Okay. They had looked into it, and it seems that there was a, uh, it was a CIA operation in the Middle East with the CIA relationship with some of the Muslim fundamentalists. And they were kind of becoming running amok and uh, getting out of control. So they were, the, so a group of CIA people was sent from Washington to tell those guys, try to find out what the situation was, and then to uh, try to straighten it out. They were also running drugs as well in this Middle East. So what happened was that the renegade CIA <coughs> people got their buddies to plant a bomb in the plane as the CIA group was coming back to the United States right. to report and possibly put the quietus on that uh, uh, right. uh, That's as good operation. a conspiracy theory as any, and, and there will be plenty. It is true, it is true that there were some high-level spooks on that plane. Whether that was coincidence or not, who knows. Mm. Um, I do know that uh, people are very expert at uh, assembling blown-up things and figuring out what kind of bomb was used, but uh, I don't know. I, it, it seems almost far-fetched to believe that they were able to trace it to the exact uh, suitcase and the exact uh, after after this thing fell blew up and then fell out of the sky thirty thousand well, feet. they said that Maybe the transfer was made, I think, in Frankfurt, uh, where right. they uh, where they had yeah. a suitcase yeah. like yeah. the one that was there. But I mean, the, the basic point is that this was yet another scenario on what well, happened to so the many. plane, right. and uh, you can uh, read all kinds. Of, and then the third, another thing that about the Lockerbie thing and blaming it on Libya, why should we believe anything that comes out of the administration? The George Bush and, and Ronald Reagan, they've lied and lied and lied over and over and over, particularly in relationship to Libya. Remember the Libyan hit squads were going to kill Ronald right. Reagan, et cetera, et cetera. Why should we believe them when they're t telling us this? Right. It, they, I'm prepared to believe they're telling the truth as much as I'm prepared to believe that uh, they're uh, manufacturing consent for the next war. I had been aware that, um, I mean, it's no secret, just count it, the United States uh, managed to get itself into a good war about every seven years or so, and I'd hoped that after this uh, last war we'd have at least five or six years reprieve and I'm getting nervous now between the noises they're making about North Korea and Cuba and, and Libya that uh, wondering what they have next in mind. Well it's very interesting that not only does George Bush say that there are we have to keep a lot of military spending because even though the Soviets are not a threat we're going to have threats from these small countries right. and they also they uh, it's policy now which uh, was pried out of the, uh, I guess, the Freedom of Information Act, that uh, a, a one of these national security directives from uh, George Bush said this is the way they're going to do it from now on. They're going to have these wars where they've got to go in the third world countries if they any of them get uppity and don't uh, do what the Americans want them to do. They've got to go in just like they did in, in uh, Iraq with overwhelming technical superiority and wipe out their infrastructure and everything else right. they can as uh, as an example and they have mentioned that there are these three countries that are left that they don't like North Korea Cuba right. and Libya right
So we might just be prepared. Be we prepared. might have to get into the streets again. That's right. The white supremacist groups who don't use the term racist, they use the term racialist, they always say that, oh, they're not uh, violent at all. However, you read incidents here and there where they do get a little bit angry at times. For instance, in Minneapolis, three students on October 17th, the University of Minnesota needed stitches after they were attacked by a gang of club-wielding white supremacists. The students were members of the Progressive Student Organization and the Anti-Racist Action Group. They've been picketing outside a campus radio station where a white racist, Tom David, who was head of the White Students Union, was participating in a call-in show. According to the Minnesota Daily, uh, David arrived at the station wearing an army helmet, didn't say whether it was Nazi helmet or American, can't tell too much difference anymore, but also had a bulletproof jacket on and he was escorted by bodyguards. And after he went inside, about a dozen of these white supremacists attacked the protesters with sticks, clubs, and chains. Gosh, nice guys. We've reported on alternative views that the burning oil well fires in Kuwait constituted the greatest ecological threat in history. There were something like 900 oil wells burning, spewing filth and pollution into the atmosphere that threatened to block the sunlight from entire regions in which the smoke would cause a screen between the sun and the atmosphere, dropping temperatures, making agricultural fail, as well as depositing acid rain, soot, pollution, and poisonous air on great areas of the earth. Well, this fall, it appears that the oil wells were finally put out, but does that mean that the ecological crisis is over? Not according to Bob Vitalis, who's an Australian oil researcher who just wrote an article in the PeaceNet that indicates that the environmental threat is still there with the oil wells in Kuwait still spewing oil into the atmosphere. You saw on television, perhaps, one of the Emir of Kuwait's underlings, the prince, put out the last oil well fire in late November. You saw beautiful sand, beautiful sky, and it looked like the pollution was over. Well, as it turned out, they brought tons of sand, of clean sand, to the desert to put over the oil-soaked, filthy sand to create a set, a stage set, to make it look like everything was okay, that the oil fires were out. Well, Vitalis reports that at least 200 are still spewing oil into the atmosphere and is causing the greatest oil lakes and oil rivers in history. Moreover, these oil lakes can deposit their pollution into the water supply of Kuwait as well as poisoning the desert and they're starting to seep into the gas. In addition, they give out a toxic fume from just the, the dissolving of the oil in the atmosphere. It gives out a toxic fume that is more deadly than the soot that is burnt, but they cannot be detected. Moreover, it seems like there's no way to stop these oil flows because the lakes are so big around some of the oil wells that the crews can't get in to stop them. Also, the pressure of these oil wells is such that they require an incredibly complicated demolition process where they have to put explosives deeply underground to stop the flow of oil coming to the surface. So it looks like it's possible that Kuwait's oil industry is simply going to be ruined, that for years to come there may not be a solution to this pollution event. The other thing that Vitalis said that I'd never heard of before in my life indicated that the United States didn't, and Britain didn't really care if the oil and in Kuwait and Iraq was destroyed in the Persian Gulf War. Because, according to Vitalis, the largest supply of oil reserves in history was found off the Falkland Islands. You remember the war that the British had with the Argentines over the Falkland Islands some years ago. Well, behind this was the greatest oil deposits in history far more than is in Saudi Arabia, according to Vitalis. But the kicker is that because the Falkland Islands are so far offshore, they're so far from the mainland that it will be very expensive to produce the oil. The only way that this could be cost effective is for the oil price to go up, which means the supply of Mideast oil has to disappear 
Once this happens, then Britain and the United States can move in for the greatest financial killing in history. This is something that I, at least, have not yet seen reported on the mainstream media, which is a curious story behind the scenes of the Persian Gulf War. We'll have another story in relationship to Bush's war against Iraq later in the program. Now let's have our interview with Bill Kelsey, who is an expert on the Middle East and just returned from a trip to Iraq, Jordan, and Israel. He concentrates on Iraq for our interview. Bill, um, what is the situation like in... Okay. Uh, well, first, I, uh, you know, I should... A lot of, lot of damage and right, people right, suffering. Right. Um, first, I should warn you, always watch out for skunks, rattlesnakes, and Middle East experts. Uh, <laughs> anybody who claims to be a Middle East expert, uh, watch out. Watch out. A lot of them got us into this last war. They trotted them all, all out during the crisis. And uh, be careful. It's uh, not a place that lends itself to expertise. I've uh, I spent my childhood there, and I went over as translator, cross-cultural coordinator, and taxi fetcher, and mm -hmm. uh, negotiator with customs people. And I had to keep seven people out of trouble in four countries, and I succeeded in that. It's a very but, complex area. Yeah, but uh, one worth uh, studying. People shouldn't throw up their hands in despair and say, well, because it's so complicated, we should, uh, we don't have any interest because a lot of uh, American wealth is poured into there, a lot of expertise and talent and, uh, I should say, destructive talent mm -hmm. goes in. And I think we have a responsibility to get down and do our homework and study what's going on. To uh, answer your question, uh, things are pretty wretched in Iraq. The Iraqis are doing a good job uh, recovering from the war. They're working real hard. They're rebuilding the big bridges and a lot of the main buildings in Baghdad that were destroyed have uh, been repaired and there are others that are beyond repair. So they're working hard. The most obvious uh, manifestation of the problem is the economy. You. Uh, an Iraqi dinar when I was there, well, one dollar would buy about nine Iraqi dinars. You go into Baghdad and stay at uh, not the top luxury hotel, but maybe the uh, bottom of the luxury hotel scale that we, our group stayed in, the Baghdad hotel, was um, 35 dinars. In other words, uh, that'd be four dollars, mm. four U.S. dollars, four double room in a nice, nice hotel. Uh, what would that have been like before the war, do you suppose? Uh, oh, it, it used to be uh, maybe uh, about a dinar to a dollar a long time ago. Oh, that's so, cool. Right, right. And there were even times when a, a dinar would be uh, as much as two dollars. But I, I don't, don't know the history of mm -hmm. the exchange rate. It just used to be one of the strongest uh, currencies in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, the people uh, who are um, mid-level employees might get 200 dinars a month's salary. So for our one night stay in the hotel that would cost us the equivalent of four dollars, they might have to work three or four days. Mm -hmm. And and that's where you see the greatest distortion for a Westerner or any outsider coming into Iraq. It's incredibly cheap, but for the people living there, they really have to scrape and hustle and do everything they can. The one meal might be two days, one meal in a restaurant might be two days labor. Oh, what about food? Are there, is there starvation there, a lot of deprivation? Um, I, I wouldn't say there's starvation at the level that you would, uh, were familiar with in, say, southern Sudan or Ethiopia. Uh, but things that are such that the weak and the poorest are, are suffering. The people have been, clearly been traumatized. You're just talking to them, looking at them, it's very clear that something horrible happened to them, both the uh, nightmare of the war itself and then everything since then. For them, the war's not over. Their, uh, uh, you know, their salary can only support their monthly salary only supports them for a week. So uh, it's uh, very difficult for them to survive. And they all would talk to us and say, "Please, we're being strangled. Our leadership, nothing's happening. The people at the top in power, they are getting all the food they want. They have nice cars. They're not in any difficulty at all. So this business of fighting Saddam Hussein by starving the people of Iraq or putting the squeeze on them. Uh, over and over again, that's what we heard. Please don't do it. If the quarrel's with Saddam Hussein, keep the quarrel with him, not with us people. I saw uh, references to 
uh, some health studies were made by the UN and also by the uh, by Harvard. Right. They were saying that there were going to be horrible consequences that 100,000 people, mainly uh, yeah. babies and old people, are going to die because of of lack of. Uh, adequate sewage facilities right. and drinking water. Is this coming to pass? It's, it's, uh, it's hard to say because the situation in Iraq doesn't lend itself to really accurate statistical analysis. For one thing, the Iraqi uh, regime itself, which hasn't had to appeal to public opinion, either domestically or, or abroad no. in the past, mm -hmm. uh, doesn't know which point to emphasize. If uh, it's revealed exactly how many people are actually dying off, it's a bad reflection on the regime. On the other hand, they can't make a strong case that they're using their resources well and efficiently and with great ingenuity to overcome all obstacles, lest they make the case that uh, the sanctions are not an issue. In fact, it's an issue as to whether 20,000 or 120,000 have died as a result, I, I can't tell you. But things happen, for example, cancer patients, there are certain cancer patients that need cobalt treatments. Cobalt can also be used in nuclear weapons, so cobalt can't go in. Uh, chlorine for water purification is not allowed into Iraq because that can be used in chemical warfare. So, oh, right. yeah. Now, of course, it's being smuggled in and snuck in, and, and people work loopholes. And uh, a lot of times the decisions are very arbitrary. It's a very complex maze as to what, what's allowed in and what's kept out. For some reason, there are cigarettes and beer all over the place. You can get all the alcoholic beverages and, and cigarettes you want, whereas, uh, and exactly why is, is something for someone else who has more time to study. It was a question I raised several times with the Iraqis, why, why are there these? And it seems that uh, because no one looks at beer and cigarettes as being a, a necessity, uh, the government keeps its hands off of it. The UN, the coalition people who manage the sanctions are not preoccupied with keeping beer out of the country or cigarettes out of the country. And likewise, the uh, Iraqi government not seeing beer as a necessity of life is not going to regulate it. As a result, it's all over the place. You know? I thought a good Muslim wasn't supposed to drink alcohol. Uh, there are some people who say that the uh, Iraqis are not the best example of uh, <laughs> pure Islam. In fact, they're it's very... It's more of a secular state anyway. So it's a very secular state. Um, I, th there are many bad things to be said about the Iraqi regime, but um, credit is, should be given when it's due. There, it is a sec secular regime, and it does not impose religious rules on the people. In fact, there are, are lots of religious sects and ethnic communities in Iraq. Some are fascinating, um, their backgrounds and history. Well, for all of the brutality of Saddam Hussein, he did do a lot of good for the people as far as things like right. uh, infrastructure and right. education right. and medical facilities. And right. And that women is also, also understood. Yeah, and that has that to right? be made clear just to uh, understand what we're dealing with and, and why um, why people did support Saddam Hussein in spite of uh, the war against Iraq. Now, the main objection to Saddam Hussein these days is I speak to exile Iraqis and what few Iraqis would speak to us in Iraq about what's really on their minds. It, uh, the man did get them into two wars, uh, oh, really three if you count the Civil War, mm -hmm. and, and they hold that against him. A lot didn't hold it against him, the Iran-Iraq war, and people say, well, that, that's really strange how sick of him to send so many hundreds of thousands of young men to their deaths. And it was indeed sick, but I would point out that he wasn't behaving any differently than Robert E. Lee or Abraham Lincoln, who, who <laughs> many Americans on one side or other take very seriously. What's the attitude of the Iraqis toward the Americans? Do you find hostility toward you and your group you um, with how many people? Uh, seven other people. Seven we, were other all, people. we were all ex-military, ex-U.S. military. Some had served in Vietnam, some had refused to go to Vietnam. We had um, a Marine combat veteran from World War II with us, who was Phil Rettinger, the uh, CIA man. He eventually went into the CIA. Um, it was very refreshing. They uh, didn't hold any hatred against the American people, just as Americans uh, tend to focus their anger against Saddam Hussein, the Iraqis are focusing it all on, on George Bush, so the American people get off the hook as, oh. as far as... 
And in particular, I, this should be said to the peace movement, which uh, I think many members of the American peace movement feel that they failed. We we're told more than once in Iraq that the Iraqi people have positive feelings towards us because they saw on television, on their television, they saw Americans demonstrating in the street and they saw that many Americans opposed the war and did not wish for this to happen. Did you tell them it was a very popular war in the United States? I uh, didn't have the heart to bring that up all the time, but when I did bring it up, uh, or other members of the group brought it up, they said, well, it wasn't their fault. Uh, they, they must have gotten brainwashed. Well, that's true. But it, it was um, fascinating. They, they, they wanted to be friends with America. It wasn't, uh, I, people had predicted uh, the long-range hatred that would happen. Uh, they did feel that Americans tried hard to avoid civilian targets, and when civilian targets were hit, they, uh, I, I saw two phenomena. One was that they blamed the Saudis and Kuwaitis. And I, I, mm. I checked this out. I'd read about it before I went there, and I checked with taxi drivers, and I checked with doctors, and I, I checked with a lot of people. They said, yeah, we feel that uh, in the West you all know how to use your equipment, and you're well trained on it, but we don't think the Saudis know how to use it. And, uh, they were probably the ones who hit our hospitals and so forth. Good heaven. Right. So, uh, and then uh, the, the other side that I saw on that uh, was when we were visiting one hospital in Hella. The town of Hella had lots of civilian targets, including hospitals and so forth, that were hit by raids, whereas Baghdad, the, the bombing was very precise and hit buildings right on target, and it really impressed people that... Uh, uh, they came away saying Americans can do anything, you know, which led them to ask why couldn't the Americans take out Saddam Hussein like they did Noriega if they felt that strongly about him, what, mm -hmm. what, what's, what, what was going on there. But anyway, um, as we were being toured around Hella and we had various doctors from the hospitals, they would say something, well, this hospital, maybe they hit it because they thought our water tower looked like a military observation post or... Uh, uh, maybe half a mile away it was that radio station they're trying to bomb the radio station and the bombs landed on this hospital it was almost as though many of the people were trying to find an excuse for uh, mm. America not hold resentment very deeply I mean, they don't want to continue this quarrel with the United States the the people you talk to know how what a cozy relationship the United States has had particularly the CIA with Saddam Hussein over the years well Saddam Hussein, it was a real delicate topic. Nobody forced us to say good things about him or challenged us. It was as though it was a taboo subject. They didn't even discuss it. I tried talking about it with some taxi drivers and they would plead total ignorance. Mm. When I first pulled into Iraq, the very first guard that we saw before we even got to the formal customs checkpoint, the first man said, uh, welcome to Iraq where everything is perfect as long as Saddam Hussein's in power. <laughs> Which... Um, some people think was code for just the opposite and uh, there were two or three other people I can think of that said that referred to him by name and said something positive about him but one of the people who, who said he supported Saddam Hussein also made the point that uh, he would prefer that the United States take him out if if George Bush and it, and it wasn't I have to make this very clear because Newsweek got this story wrong they, Newsweek wrote a story that implied that the Iraqi people were allied with the uh, the the American invasion and were disappointed that the job quote unquote wasn't finished well, what, what's actually going on is no um, Saddam Hussein is the best alternative but if George Bush has strong feelings against Saddam Hussein, then he should take Saddam Hussein out and not be st starving the old people and, and the infants of uh, Iraq. That's the point that is made. As far as the cozy relationship, there's no way to get into that deeply with uh, the Iraqis. However, one of the people on the group uh, is Phil Rettinger, who, as I mentioned, had served in the CIA. He was the individual who overthrew the Guatemalan government in 1954 at the instruction of Alan Dulles head of the CIA. Uh, he said, I don't, I don't know too much about Saddam Hussein, but the main thing I have against him is that uh, he was one of our hitmen when I was in the CIA. So we yes, say, what? He uh, says, yeah, he was, he was one of our assassins. And um, I'd heard this a few, from a few other sources, but you know, I don't believe anything in the Middle East till I hear it from three or four sources, and I would tell our audience, 
they shouldn't believe this until they hear it from several more mm -hmm. sources, but it's uh, a definite lead to follow. While I was there in uh, Baghdad, lo and behold, here I have a, a newspaper, the Baghdad Observer. Oh, it's in English. Is that a translation of... Well, no, no, this is... They, they, they have a newspaper. There's a big English-speaking community in, in Baghdad. I mean, there aren't that many people there now reading the newspaper. They're distributing this free in the hotel. Mm. Um, but it gets published every day. But this story right here, it says, President honors brave partisans. And incidentally, every newspaper in, in Iraq has one picture or another of Saddam Hussein. This isn't the best one. It's just a picture of him downtown. <laughs> what he did was go down to Rashid Street, and he decorated, he put a ribbon on a statue of a fellow by the name of Ghreri. Ghreri, Abdul Wahab al Ghreri. Who, uh, what happened in 1959, Saddam Hussein and about six other people uh, took it upon themselves, and here's Saddam Hussein's quote, regardless of philosophical, technical, and other explanations, the decision expressed the conscience of the people. What he's saying, what's referring to is a group of Arab Ba'ath Socialist Party's then young members, including the president, attacked the then dictator Prime Minister Abdul Karim Qasim with machine guns in a daring operation to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. And again, the president speaking says the attacking team comprised seven persons, including the president himself, who was wounded in the leg during the attack. So here's Saddam Hussein going downtown, um, putting a ribbon on the statue of one of his buddy, a fellow assassins who in this failed assassination attempt, uh, one of his buddies got killed, and so a year later, they successfully right, killed, they uh, killed him. Qasim, they successfully, and then Saddam Hussein arranged, or the people who came to power put up a statue of Ghreri, the assassin who had not uh, made it out of the attempt, and I guess coincidentally while we were there, I, I tried to see it wasn't the anniversary, it wasn't anything, but uh, he thought it was appropriate to go downtown and hang a ribbon on this statue and, and decorate the other surviving assassins. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, the story that um, I'm getting from one or two sources is that Abdul Karim Qasim was assassinated at the expense of the CIA. The CIA paid for it. Well, I read an article also in which you talked about this and yeah. said that the CIA provided transportation and facilities right. and all for uh, who knows yeah, yeah. for them who to knows? I'm, carry I'm prepared out this. to believe it uh, completely and uh, it's is the type of story that neither Saddam it's such a scandal on both sides so you can count on neither side admitting it I mean Saddam Hussein obviously can't come out and say I used to be an assassin for the CIA and the CIA can't admit that uh, this uh, great demon uh, of the last year got his career uh, with their help, got his career started with their help. Well, it's parallel to, uh, I mean, he's the type of person that the CIA would uh, would like to have right. set up in yeah. other countries, so it's certainly... Whether it was their intention for him to become head of state and, or not, who knows, but uh, anyway, it's... Uh, Did you go to uh, Kuwait? Uh, or no, we went right to down to the border. We uh, didn't get to Kurdistan. We did not make it up there, but we went to Basra. When we saw Karbala, we saw Najaf, uh, we saw... Those um, were places that took an awful lot of punishment. To right, right. We saw Hilla and uh, Safwan. We were in Safwan. Not only was there, did they take punishment during the war itself, these cities in the south, but then after the war, there was an uprising. And there was lots of damage uh, during the uprising. To the credit of the people who were showing us around, they did not try to say that uh, the damage that came about as a, as a result of the Civil War was due to the Allies. They're were, they were pretty honest and straightforward. Also, once you saw the damage, you got an idea of which types of damage were caused by U.S. bombing and and which type were caused by internal fighting, just the way the, the types of bullets and the types of bombs, you, you could see it very mm. clearly. How long did this Civil War last? It wasn't all that long. It, it wasn't all that long. It started before the uh, American ceasefire actually went into effect. Um, what the Iraqis told us is that there were agents who came over from Iran, and there were local hoodlums, as they put it, uh, who uh, rebelled and took advantage of the breakdown in communications. Uh, there were some people who hinted that they would have liked a rebellion to succeed, but these particular people were very unsavory. Uh, 
folks who were reluctant uh, or unenthusiastic about Saddam Hussein were also very unenthusiastic about the people leading the uprising. They were Muslim fundamentalists, but they didn't have any program. They didn't have any clear ideology. Their idea when they took over a town was to burn the administration building. They didn't try to administer the town or, or mm. anything. Uh, one person who explained it to me said if they had a good program, if they had been able to explain themselves, they probably would have succeeded. And he hinted that he m might have appreciated seeing them, seeing a successful rebellion, but these particular people weren't. Um, and it was very intense. I mean, just judging by the damage and also judging by the fact that it was in a widespread area. I mean, I'm talking the southern, whole southern half of Iraq basically was, had this problem. What was your from what you've, you've read and the people you talked to. Did you, well, first of all, did you talk to people who had uh, come out of Kuwait and what did they say about what was going on there? Did you say we went down to the border um, in Safwan and every Tuesday and Thursday, I believe it was, several busloads of people come out of Kuwait who are not being expelled directly from Kuwait but from prisons in Kuwait. and. Every day there are people being repatriated. And just as, uh, well, it seems whenever there's a ceasefire line and when you have two structures or two groups of structures that have gone to the trouble of committing organized mass mur murder, whichever side of the line you stand on, you'll hear all sorts of atrocity stories about the other side. And, and they're all believable. We uh, witnessed people coming out of Iraq uh, there was one man standing there at the border who had been gone down to the border every Tuesday and every Thursday for about two months waiting to see if his wife was coming out. And the day we were there, um, a group of women came out and they had just been released from jail and they said, yeah, your wife's in jail and she's singing about you every day and we think she'll be out next week. So he, he was really uh, overjoyed. Um, I, I think about that and time my, my wife's one or two hours late, I can just remember that fellow who spent two months not knowing if his wife was alive or dead. What are some of the stories they tell about their treatment? Oh, uh, the, the standard torture stories. People get slapped around, people get raped. Uh, it's, well, virtually everything that you heard that Iraqis were doing to Kuwaitis, you now hear that Kuwaitis are doing to the Palestinians and you hear that they're doing it to um, the Bedouins. There's a group of people called Bedouin, which isn't to be confused with Bedouin. Oh. Okay. Bedou, uh, uh, Bedouin is really Bedou. Okay. They are nomads, and Bedou is the formal name for them. These are people who are nomads. A similar word, Bedouin, means without. Oh. And so there was a group of people who didn't really. Um, they were no more part of Iraq, Saudi Arabia, or Kuwait no more one than the other, but as Kuwait was set up, they might have been Bedou as well. Some of them may have as well been Bedou. They gravitated to Kuwait. They worked for Kuwait. Some of them even served in the Kuwaiti army. They uh, served as security guards. They were, they were part of Kuwait, but they weren't part of the original families uh, of the original Kuwait village who mm -hmm. uh, had power in the country and who gave themselves Kuwaiti citizenship. Uh, these people spent their entire lives and careers in Kuwait, and now they're being punished. It's uh, the Kuwaitis are reacting like, well, it's a, all these people who weren't Kuwaitis who were living in our country. They're the ones who call it caused us to uh, downfall. And so the Bedouin are getting expelled. Bedouin means without. They don't have any citizenship. They don't belong to Iraq. They don't belong to uh, Saudi Arabia. And technically, they don't belong to Kuwait as far as the Kuwaitis are concerned. So we saw these people being expelled. And Palestinians, I think there used to be about three, 350,000. Uh, and when we were there, the count was estimated to be at 50,000. 300,000 Palestinians had been expelled. And the Palestinians in Kuwait did not all collaborate. I mean, they are being punished for what Yasser Arafat did. And the way the Kuwaitis are handling it is people are punished by national bloc. So there were Kuwaitis who collaborated. There were some Palestinians who collaborated with the Iraqis. There were uh, Syrians who collaborated. Uh, there were Egyptians who collaborated. Uh, there were Sudanese who collaborated. But once the Kuwaiti Emir was restored, the way the Kuwaitis are handling it is 
punishing population groups according to the position of their government. So the Syrians who collaborated aren't being punished. The uh, Palestinians en masse are being punished because of what uh, Yasser Arafat did. The Sudanese and the Yemenis, they're being punished and thrown out. The Egyptians, whether they collaborated or not, they're not being uh, punished. And a lot of what constituted collaboration was um, just doing things like going to school or going to work. The Kuwaitis made a decision to stay inside. Oh. One of the ways the Kuwaitis were able to stay inside, they, ex they, they stayed inside a lot of them. Either they're afraid to go outside or they did it as an act of protest or it was just too da dangerous for some of the, the men especially. Well, how did they get away with being able to be cooped up in their houses? They had to depend on other people like Palestinians to bring them money. Uh, Palestinians did shopping for them. Uh, other non-Kuwaiti people uh, did things. Another point of, of uh, they did things for the folks who stayed in their houses. And now this is considered collaboration because they were out and walking around buying and selling, going to, to work. Um, it was considered collaboration if you took your Kuwaiti license plate off the car and put an Iraqi plate on, which you were required to do. Well, the Kuwaiti families might have five cars. So they'll lock up four of their cars, change the license plate on one of them, and they'll keep their cars all locked up. A Palestinian might have only one car. In order to drive around, he has to change his license plate. So he put an Iraqi license plate on, and now that would be proof of, of uh, collaboration hmm. that he put the, the Iraqi license plate on. So the, the, the Kuwaitis are not uh, acting in a very enlightened fashion at all towards the people in, in, in their own country now. We had a news story that the incident of rape in Kuwait, particularly by the army and just roaming gangs and maybe the police forces, is very uh, prevalent. Right, and it's, again, it's a situation that doesn't lend itself to gathering of statistics because uh, women aren't inclined to tell about it. You hear the stories and some people say that it's happening in their eyewitness accounts, but it's, it's hard to pin down. But we, we heard it uh, virtually all over the Middle East and in uh, both from the people at the border who were observing the people coming out. We heard it from Red Cross. We heard it from Norwegian UN medical personnel, um, people in Jordan who were receiving. Uh, Jordan is the country that's receiving most of the uh, people expelled from Kuwait. They seem to be fairly common knowledge there. What were your feelings uh, about Iraq and the Iraqi people when you, on the way back? Um, very, very positive. You know, there was a, a joke uh, making the rounds during the war uh, which uh, referred to Iraqi women as scuds, and I, I think I'd be very annoyed if I heard that joke again because Iraqi women are so beautiful. And you mean the Americans, the Allies were... No, no, I, it, was, it was a joke making the, circ the rounds here in the United States. Oh, in the United States. About Iraqi women in which they referred to as scuds, and, and they're, they're really uh, beautiful women. The, the people were very uh, correct at worst with us and very friendly at, uh, at best. Uh, naturally, there's a double moral bookkeeping whenever you have a war in which they're all too ready to talk about the atrocities that the other side has done to them, um, but more either reluctance or just lack of information about the atrocities that their side might have done to someone else. Um, where I, uh, one story I, uh, that stands most vivid in my mind is that in uh, Basra, there are merchants that are paying people to go out and gather landmines, and they're paying between the equivalent of three and four dollars for each landmine, depending on what type it is. And these, un these unemployed oh fellows are going God. off into the desert and uh, with shovels and no mine detection equipment, and they're just scratching around with their hands and with their shovels trying to find these landmines. And uh, the program had been going on for about four weeks when we were there in Basra, and we heard about it. Um, we heard that the Norwegian hospital in the UN zone was uh, uh, taking in casualties, about five or six casualties a day of guys coming in with their feet blown off or hands blown off or more. And so we went down there and had a very nice, uh, very eye-opening encounter with the Norwegians. And three fellows had just been brought in from the desert right before we got there. And one of them uh, 
he had had his throat all mangled to hear from some horrible injury he'd gotten during the Iran-Iraq war. He was a military veteran himself. And uh, his other leg had been mangled from another injury in the war. And he pulled the, the, uh, the blanket off and the, he had about 12 bullet holes here on his shoulder and his arm plus miscellaneous shrapnel scars. Um, his hand was mangled from something and now he lost his foot uh, gathering mines. You know, it was uh, a real metaphor, I thought, for you know, how much uh, abuse can life take and you know, uh, amazing that this fellow had survived it all. And w what he had to do to survive was to go out and try to gather these landmines and then in spite of it all, there he was still, uh, still surviving. And try, I've tried to think what, what that says. Um, Southern Iraq as a whole was a real, um, I, I thought, real blasphemy against creation. It, uh, the environment was very messed up between what the bulldozers had done during the Iran-Iraq war to build defensive fortifications. I mean, all along in that whole southern area, you've got trenches and earthworks and things for tanks to hide behind and so on, and that looks real ugly. And then there's this junk all over the place, all this unrecognizable, things that have been blown up. There are whole junkyards full of military hardware that have been blown to bits and or, or that have been gathered up. Miles and miles of them are in these big parking lots full of... Uh, and, and then there are things that are unrecognizable, knocked over pylons and... Uh, it, it's just a real mess. I mean, it's, uh, it's a real uh, attack on the earth when you have war nowadays. Well, the Gulf War was over, and the question now arises, was it worth it? We have a total destruction of Iraq. The whole infrastructure of that country was destroyed. There are between 170,000 and 240,000 dead Iraqis from the war, according to a recent survey by Greenpeace. S Kuwait was ruined during the invasion and the ground war. Their infrastructure was destroyed, their oil wells are on fire, and are now spewing forth oil into the desert, and their whole oil industry seems to have been destroyed because Bush refused to negotiate a settlement to the war and insisted on the ground war. You have no more democracy than you ever had in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. The ruling family in Kuwait has come back into power. It's repressed human rights it's of the Palestinians and other non-Kuwaiti minorities. It has created a more repressive situation than even before with kangaroo courts, with throwing non-Kuwaiti citizens out of the country. And likewise, in Iraq. Saddam Hussein is still in power. His Ba'ath party continues to oppress the Kurds and other religious minorities in the country. So it appears that nothing really was accomplished by that war. In fact, this war was the most expensive event in recent history. Hundreds of billions of dollars were destroyed worth of property in that war. There was a recent estimate in the Australian Financial Review that $250 billion worth of the Iraqi infrastructure was destroyed, a hundred billion dollars worth of their military equipment. The United States paid a hundred billion dollars worth of military equipment in the war. In Kuwait, a hundred billion dollars worth of their infrastructure was destroyed and a hundred and twenty billion dollars worth of private property. So far, forty billion dollars worth of their oil has been destroyed through the oil fires and the oil wells that are now out of control. And again, it appears that nothing was gained by this. Well, when the left wing was discussing what the war was all about, they were claiming that it was a war for oil, to control the oil resources and supplies from that area. But it appears to me, in retrospect, it was really more about the control of petrodollars and saving the military-industrial complex. The real investment of Kuwait was not in oil, but was in petrodollars. They have something like $200 billion invested in the United States and Britain, and the United States wanted to keep control of the Kuwaiti investment in the Western camp. Saddam Hussein had threatened to take all of the investments of his country, Iraq, and Kuwait, and invest them into the Soviet Union, the East Bloc, or the Middle East, and the United States was very concerned 
concerned to keep controlling the investment of petrodollars. They were also concerned to save the military industrial complex. Not only were there massive cuts that were threatening the military, but this also threatened the military industrial complex, who turned out to be the major beneficiary of the Persian Gulf War. During the very first week of the crisis in the Gulf, before a shot was fired in August, Kuwait and the Saudis and the other oil emirates bought a tremendous amount of weapons from the United States for future use. Saudi Arabia signed a contract for $40 billion, the biggest deal in history in August of 1990, and Omar, Bahrain, and the Kuwaitis followed up, buying many tens of million, billions more in arms. Moreover, rebuilding Kuwait is going to be another $100 billion contracts for the corporations that are involved in the military industrial complex and in the construction area of that region, such as the Bechtel Corporation, which has gotten a lot of the big uh, contracts to rebuild Kuwait. So it seems that the real interest in that war was to protect the investment and to keep going with the military industrial complex. It was also revealed recently in Mother Jones that Scott Armstrong discovered that there was already a $200 billion military infrastructure in Saudi Arabia, and this was also part of the Gulf War. They needed to put it to use to justify it, and of course they wanted to add to it to get many more billions of dollars worth of contracts. So it really wasn't so much about oil, the Gulf War, as it was about the military industrial complex, petrodollars, and of course the failing presidency of George Bush. Bush's popularity was nose diving. It appeared he wasn't going to win a second term. He was flubbing tremendously on the domestic scene. He had the greatest deficit and SNL crisis in history to deal with. And he wanted to to detract attention from these domestic problems and to puff himself up as a great wartime leader. He thought that every great president needed a war, that war is the event that brings the country together in a patriotic wargasm, which is exactly what happened in the Persian Gulf War, and that this would boost his failing popularity, and indeed it did. So again, it was George Bush that was pushing the hardest for the Persian Gulf War. Another person pushing very hard for it was Brent Scowcroft, whose Bush Bush's national uh, security advisor. Scowcroft was a former lieutenant general in the Air Force. He was Gerald Ford's national security advisor. And then he quit and joined Kissinger Associates, Henry Kissinger's multi-billion dollar consulting firm that does deals with every country in the Mideast that was involved in the war from Iraq through Kuwait through Saudi Arabia. Moreover, Scowcroft was on the board of directors of the the Santa Fe International, which was a Kuwaiti-owned company that had an American oil drilling company that Scowcroft, again, was deeply involved in this country company. He also held stocks in 40 companies who had major interests in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. So when Brent Scowcroft was pushing for the Persian Gulf War, he was pushing for his own economic interests. He was pushing for the companies whose stocks he owned. He was pushing for the, for the defense industry that he had been closely aligned with. He was also on the board of directors of North, Northrop Airlines, which is one of the big corporations that makes uh, military equipment. So this is a major scandal that simply has not been exposed in the mass media. Frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications, which we use on Alternative Views, and also a reading list for U.S. power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these, send a stamped, self-addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. You must send a self-addressed stamped envelope. We also can provide you with information on how to get some of the publications by former CIA officer John Stockwell. We'd like to thank the members of our crew, Eric Eubank, Kevin L. West, and Brian Lynch, who is the director of our interview. Alternative Views is a presentation of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713.